Ratan Tata passed away at age 86. He was suffering from age-related health issues and he peacefully breathed his last at a Mumbai hospital. His loss is impossible to quantify. He was a towering figure, an icon of Indian industry and will leave a huge void by people who knew him and even by those who didn't. In fact, an entire nation is mourning his loss. And on this special episode, we are going to celebrate what made Ratan Tata the man he is. Yes, absolutely. I think, Urmas, as you said, even people who didn't know him, it's a personal loss for me, for example. I never knew the man. Unfortunately, never got to meet him. Uh, for, for some reason, was very close to him, you know, maybe six feet away from him and things like that, but just never got to meet him. And I felt such a loss yesterday night when, when we were talking, uh, spoke to my wife, my children, everyone, it was like, oh, we lost someone who we knew, who we knew on a personal level, and yet we didn't. And I think that came about from his personality more than, I, like, we didn't, we didn't admire him as a businessman. We admired him as Ratan Tata, as a person, his personality, humble, uh, down to earth, you know, he didn't have any form. In fact, you know, what was is this one story I can share? I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of insights uh, today that we will be sharing with our with our audience uh, and stories. But I have just one, you know, where uh, Andrea was at uh, the Taj. She, she was doing a show there, uh, waiting for me to pick her up at the side entrance, you know, the one on the, on the road, uh, not the main Taj entrance. And I picked her up. She got into the car and she said, guess who was standing next to me? And I said, who? Oh, she's Ratan Tata. I was like, really? She said, yeah, he just got picked up. And she was so blown by the fact. She said, I was standing there. I didn't know it was him. He stood there with one man with an umbrella because it was raining at the time. And his car came up. Uh, she can't remember what the car it was, but she said it was a small car. The car came up. He got into the car and he drove off. No police escorts, no 10 people hovering around him. He just stood there waiting for his car just like she was got into the car and drove off, drove off, you know, and I think that really is what we all admire, right? It's just simplicity and humble. I think it really is a simplicity and, and honestly, there are a lot of stories like this. I have to say I have been privileged and honoured to know him and to know him quite well at a personal level. Uh, he's even come home for dinner on, on some occasions uh, and to be honest, a completely low maintenance guest. Uh, not someone who likes fancy fare with his food. I mean, his favorite dish is like good old Parsi, what we call papitana cutlets. He loves that. That's one of his uh, favorite uh, dishes. Uh, really a simple man. I mean, there are stories where, you know, he's come out of the Taj and given his valet ticket to the valet to get his own car. It was a Honda Civic at that time. So he loved his Civic. He loved multiple cars. Of course, we'll come into his cars in a bit later. But you know, even when he would come over, he would, uh, you know, take a lift uh, with a friend. I mean, he wouldn't be keeping his driver over time or anything like that. I mean, um, once uh, also, I, I, I remember I picked him up uh, from home and, and got him over simply because we had some interesting car to drive. So, took him for a drive in that. Absolutely low maintenance. I mean, uh, you know, you would see him when he wasn't flying uh, a private, when he would be flying a commercial, he'd just be... Uh, checking in as a normal guy without any any fanfare. But, you know, I think that is one side of him. I, I think there's a, another side of him, which is, uh, you know, he was a fighter. And that's why when I heard he was unwell uh, in hospital, you know, I think I thought he would bounce back because, you know, he's been having a lot of age-related issues uh, because he's got that fighting spirit and that's really, you know, kind of defined a lot of what he did. Like when he took over, uh, you know, he was he had, was chairman of the Tata Group for a long time, from 91 to 2012. First, you know, he kind of dealt, he fought with the powerful unions, you know, got that sorted. Uh, there were, within his organization, there were challenges, there were well-entrenched satraps, which, you know, he kind of, uh, you know, won that battle as well. Uh, whether it was to get uh, chorus, you know, he aggressively outbid a lot of uh, multinationals to, uh, to win chorus. And, uh, you know, Lastly and sadly, it was uh, his fight with Cyrus Mystery where he showed, you know, some incredible tenacity to take the fight, a long drawn bitter battle all the way to the end and emerge victorious. And what's interesting is that after all these battles, he's always come out stronger. And the way he's approached it is really with 
with a kind of a certain grace and and a way of doing things. So, you know, a very humble man, but a man with a very, very strong, steely resolve underneath. And always, you know, I, I think also the other thing that he did for Tata is his era, I think, really defined Tata's globalization. Now, you mentioned Chorus. Uh, that's a that's a perfect example because, yes, the Tata group has been, you know, sort of, you can say, a sort of hallmark of India. But I think what made it global or who made it global we could really say it's Ratan Tata. Absolutely. And he came into the Tata group at a very critical point in India's history. You know, 1991 is when he came in. That's when, you know, we had the balance of issue payment. That's when the industry was opened up. And 1993, the auto segment, uh, auto sector was de-licensed. And, you know, everyone was worried about the flood of competitors coming in, you know. but uh, And he never wanted this Bombay club approach to being protected, you know, I mean, he was willing to kind of um, take, on take on global competition. And we've seen that. I mean, even if you see in the car business, okay, he had, they had a joint venture with Mercedes. I think that was more of Suman Bulgankar because, uh, you know, a long association with Mercedes from trucks from 1954, right. they've been associated making trucks in you know, under license. So they had a relationship with Mercedes. That joint venture didn't last too long. Uh, but you know, while others were looking at joint ventures, you had Mahindra going with Ford, uh, you had DCM Devu, uh, you had even Aicha looking, uh, Toyota. Uh, Toyota, you know, they, they all, um, uh, you know, came with joint ventures. And I think we don't cover the LCV industry. But that was a true battleground in the 80s because you had all the Japanese there. I remember the brands also. You had Alvin Nissan, you had Mitsubishi, Aicha, uh, you know, you had Swaraj, oh, Mazda. Oh, yeah. All of them came. And the Tata 407, just by what it was, it just blew them all away. Exactly. So that really was, you know, it, it, it really, you, you felt good. You know, that was Tata really fighting global competition. And of course, the Indica, that right. in itself is probably, to me, his, you know, biggest and his most critical moment and probably his greatest moment. He's got so many great so moments. Many. Yeah, exactly. Because, uh, you know, he's won so many um, accolades. He's been globally feted, awarded. Re recognized globally, he's a global leader, literally, you know, and uh, there's no one like him in that sense. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of people will write a book or many books on all his achievements. Uh, but uh, I think if I was to pick right. his probably his greatest achievement, it would be the Indica. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that one, Mas, you know, coming to, yes, uh, coming to, to coming to the cars, the automobile, which is why we are discussing the man as well. If you were to pick, because Maybe there are quite a few also. The one greatest one would be the Indica. So since you've picked the Indica, uh, why don't you tell us the story behind uh, sort of Ratan Tata's drive to get this out and, uh, you know, how he sort of, uh, I, I, in fact, you should start off with the story of the first photographs you saw of the Indica. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, I mean, before that, you know, we need to understand, uh, I think that really defined why he singularly kind of made took Tata Motors from what would have been just a truck making company to what is a very modern, uh, you know, uh, passenger car company today, which even in includes uh, Jaguar Land Rover. I mean, it's absolutely mega. We don't need to go into how big Tata Motors has become. Mm -hmm. You know, it is like, uh, you know, fighting in the top three right now uh, of, uh, in, in, exactly. in in the passenger car space. Uh, it has it has had its challenges along the way. But uh, honestly, if it wasn't for the Indy car, you know, it probably would have still remained make, uh, being a truck company. But making the Indica a success in the face of global competition, I mean, that really was the challenge. You know, let's let's just go back at that time, mid-90s, uh, uh, you know, people didn't know, didn't have a global vision. Ratan Tata did. You know, he was an architect by profession. He traveled the world. He knew, had a sense of aesthetic. So, you know, you're talking about, uh, I remember being in his office uh, one, one day to talk about that picture and he took out an old envelope and, and showed me that. Uh, I said, what's this? He said, well, that's what the Indica could have been. And it was this horrible, boxy, very sad looking car. Uh, you know, we, we, we saw these kind of cars where the micro cars were coming out. We saw Kinetic trying to do it. Uh, we saw them trying to build these very boxy cars, very functional without any emotion or appeal. He saw that and realized that, you know, if they were to make this, um, it was really going to bomb. So I think it was that crucial decision at that point, which only Ratan Tata could have taken because he had the vision. He had even the guts to literally tear that up and say, listen, guys, we don't have the design talent. 
I mean, don't forget, Tata Motors was a truck maker. They had no design sense at all. You know, they made good trucks at that time. You can't even blame them. But he did realize that. And they went abroad to India. Uh, uh, design house. A talent in India exactly. as well. At that time, they paid about 70, 70 to cross just for design, which was an astronomical sum at that time. But you know how it's paid off? Because yeah. it yeah. made the difference between whether the Indy car would flop or fly. And I think... We all know what an impact the Indica made. It was a design which was kind of led by uh, Ratan Tata along with the people at India. And on, I remember the date also, December, uh, sorry, January 15th, 1998, I was right out there trying to take a picture. I mean, there was a frenzied response, response to this. I mean, I think the styling, the design, so much nicer than anything available at the time was half the battle won. And in fact, it helped overcome a lot of the quality issues that there were at that time. You know, and I think, uh, and a lot of hiccups it had along the way. So I think uh, that was, that was his decision, you know, to take that call, not to have it designed here and to go to India and put, and he not only kind of created a great looking car, he put Tata cars on the global stage when it was completely unheard of. Don't forget industry, de license in 93. We were just known for Maruti's premises, but Mini's and sure. Motley lot of cars. And suddenly, 93 to 98, we've got yeah. a, a Tata made car yeah. at the Geneva Motor Show. Uh, I remember Diana Hayden, who was Miss World at that time, she was there. And it got global attention. And it got, unfortunately, the attention of the Fiat boss, Paolo Cantarella, right. who saw this as a copy of the Palio. Don't forget, Fiat were launching the Palio later on in the year. And this wasn't exactly a copy, but same proportions. In fact, we I did a story at that time in, in Auto India uh, that the a Palio uh, or the Indica was a copy of the Palio. And uh, the owner's wife, Mrs. Uh, Manta Gadza, she accosted me at the 98 uh, Geneva show and just screamed at me and said, you're the only one in the world who thinks, uh, <laughs> you know, the Indica is a copy of the Palio. Uh, so very, very distraught because they knew it was going legal at that time. But you know, that's what a lot of people felt. So Fiat had gone to IDEA, Tata Motors had gone to IDEA and Paolo Cantarella freaked out because he said IDEA had copied the design. Um, Fiat was IDEA's biggest client. They lost the business. There were lost cases after that. And here's where Ratan Tata's compassion comes in. You know, what, what he did was, IDEA was sort of finished with uh, after this issue. So he took the key team members uh, started a company called Trilix. They started a company called Trilix, which in effect was Tata Motors design arm. I think Tata Motors then bought 80% into Trilix, so it kind of became a Tata company. And these key people, you can imagine undying loyalty for what they did, and they gave some of Tata Motors' best design work. So, you know, the Vista, which came out after that, was done by them. Even the Tata Nano, a very radical car, rear engine, a lot of space inside. So I think, uh, uh, you know, that, that Justin Norick did. In fact, the last time I spoke to Mr. Tata was, um, you know, just um, about a couple of weeks back. And uh, I called him up to give him the bad news that uh, Justin Norik had passed away. And, you know, we were planning to catch up, but, you know, that never happened. So um, I think, uh, you know, uh, design was something that he drove. And that probably is still his biggest legacy in the cars you see. Yeah. And almost that, uh, the Italian designs arm that we talk of very often, right? Uh, they have one in Italy, one in that's the UK. That's Trilix, yeah. Yeah, that's Trilix. It's yeah, born that's right. That, it's still exactly. functional today. It is still functional today. So, you know, clearly, uh, and, and, you know, design is one of those things which I think Tata has, everyone knows they've kind of aced it. There's a universally like design language which they have, which has a very strong kind of uh, influence of uh, Mr. Tata himself. I mean, till recently, even in uh, after he had, um, uh, you know, really retired, he was still being shown design. They would always pass a new look, whether it was the new Harrier, the Safari, or even the new Jaguar cars, because his sense of design was so phenomenal, he would he would pick up things. Yeah, like the F-type was. I mean, uh, he had a personal involvement in, I think, the taillights and the nose. And it's very interesting on the F-type, and I think he was right, and I... I mean, felt the same way. You know, they wanted to be an E-type knee. And he felt the bonnet wasn't long enough or strong enough, you know. And he told the designer, he and Callum this. So I think he told me, Ian Callum said, do you want me to change it? He said, no, 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 don't change it. It was too late. He said, but I'm just telling you. And, you know, he kind of um, uh, he, had that eye. he had that eye. 
what was the you were talking about uh, i'm i'm just going to go back you know you're talking about you said he had the guts to tear things up and there's another story i i want to you to share because so we we will talk about all the things he did but there were some things that he also chose not to do the magna also took guts right i i i think yeah it 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 did it took the magna i think they invested 300 crores in that uh, uh, i i i in fact he he asked he also at that time we were chatting he said should we do this i said look you doing a, a ladder frame sedan with a longitudinal engine or a safari engine is not going to fly they had tooled up for it i think at that time it was 300 crores they just scrapped it at that point yeah so yeah what was you know but besides the design and and the styling i think it was the whole concept that really made it a hit right yeah that's right in fact there was that i think his famous the line which was uh, first you know used in business world magazine i remember my colleague my friend sanjay narayan had done that uh, it was he said the indica would be the size of a zen so nice and compact with the interior space of an ambassador so fantastic packaging at the price of a maruti 800 with the running cost of diesel and i think that's where you know it made the difference this was a car designed by an indian company for indians oh, India. don't forget the maruti 800 a great car that it was but originally conceived for well manicured streets of japan you know i mean it 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 won hearts with its reliability and the fact yeah. that there was nothing else close but this was the first real threat and i remember when the car was launched in i think or price announced in late december uh 99 i think uh, or 98 right. sorry like it, it, it i think uh, maruti also slashed the price of 800 yes. for the first time then i remember there was a, a showcase of the uh, production cars and when we were test driving uh, the uh, uh, indica before the market launch it was still some months away you know you had all these press guys everyone wanted to know the price because clearly he said the price of a maruti 800 so everyone wanted to know but he wasn't ready yeah. you had these press guys badgering him saying that you know sir but what is the price so he very politely said you know we are not ready to uh, announce it yet so but they kept going on and on you could see he was getting a, a little peeved over there he would never show it one of the most courteous and soft spoken men there was so the one journalist asked him sir but just give us a range so he said okay it's between 1 lakh oh, sorry it's between 1 rupee and 10 lakhs <laughs> you know so that was a kind of sense of humor he had but um, uh, i i i think uh, not many people know that you know he had a fantastic sense of humor was uh, a great mimic and uh, you know really was uh, uh, you know in 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 late, later years i was fortunate to meet him have um, you know a cup of coffee just chat on random stuff and uh, you know just just an amazing simple guy you know you could never imagine he was this towering personality who achieved so much yeah and always i think you also met him to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the scar right you you went there personally and Th- that's right you know and i'll be honest uh, i i think uh, it's something that should have been celebrated more i did it in my own way because i'm a big fan of this car because of what it says this is your car <laughs> this is my car you know which uh, i i bought and uh, you know to uh, obviously to remember Uh, a great piece of uh, indian automotive history and you know this is mr tata's legacy as well so this is a car i i b- bought and will treasure uh, but i took this car to him you know and we cut a small cake he was really touched uh, it was on the 15th of jan 2023 that was uh, just after the auto show at that time and uh, 25 years of the indica it had long ceased it had stopped production but you know a quarter of a century back you know indian there was history being made and i think it was to celebrate that and i was very touched that you know he even gave us a small message we thank uh auto car for its support of this venture and the indica and it's been a long 25 years in the support to indian industry has been outstanding so really this car shook up uh, the leaders uh, global establishment everyone was looking at it lots of quality issues on the way i think if you ask me one of the regrets other than nano not doing well or nano bombing was the quality problem you know and indica had a lot of qualities initially and quality has been a moving target for tata motors and uh, you know he once chatting with me he was struck by a remark which rajiv dubey who you know was worked very closely with him and turned out to be the president of uh, the tata motors passenger division 
told him and he related this to me he said rajiv told me that basically we are a truck company with a passenger division bolted on it so it meant changing the mindset uh, in fact you know just looking at the earlier interviews i did with him he said it's not just machines and processes we have to change our mindset to improve quality of course you know uh, quality has improved dramatically uh, since then now right now a little bit of a backlash on 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 some of the software issues but uh, it's always been a kind of a moving target and i think that's one of the uh, you know let's say uh, challenges or, or i think that's always a tim somewhere but um, i think uh, you know it's it's unbelievable what the indica has done and you know uh, we've got this family tree which we've done that everything the whole all the cars today uh, or most of the cars today are rooted in the indica yeah. yeah including the mega hit the nexon not many the people nexon, realize that the nexon is the second generation indica the vista on the x1 platform originally when that platform was conceived you know you wondered why it was a heavy platform it had a lot of inbuilt safety features then now the thinking was it was for the european export markets which never happened but you know that's paying dividends right now because uh, you know it's they've got a structure that is crash worthy right from back then and uh, you know that that benefit is there it kind of moved away from the uh, independent rear suspension which the indica had was a mistake because you know on indian roads uh, too much in control the a uh, camber led to a uh, tire where they went back to a non independent learned a lot so a lot of learning along the way and it wasn't just you know the entire family that went on was when the indica was launched you had multiple variants also designed you had a uh, sedan you had a station wagon a uh, compact sedan a uh, compact sedan in fact uh, exactly tata motors invented the compact sedan with the indigo cs so really you know it was uh i think those were really the halicon days of the company you know a lot of innovation uh and uh, uh, you know uh, i think for him the marina was very special because you know he could uh, make uh, the 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 severe seat flat uh put mattresses and take his dogs for drives and that so i think he he used the marina a lot for that but uh not only were all these variants there i think it's very important to note that with the indica came an entire supplier ecosystem and that's how taco was born you know tata components at that time now it's become tata auto comp and again that's his legacy tata auto comp is now doing work for multiple uh, brands and uh, exactly so uh, i i think you know there's so much that he has done and you know it's really hard to kind of speak about all that in just a limited time through i think uh, while we can get to jaguar land rover later but i i think uh, you know indica it kind of gave tata motors that that confidence springboarded the company to go on for bigger things and probably the biggest thing was jlr yeah, the acquisition absolutely. again ratan tata's vision he saw that ford had spent billions of dollars developing some fantastic products and because of their own strategies where they just wanted to focus on one ford and get out of you know all the other brands they just sold this company which were really big uh some fantastic products just ready to be put into the market so But, uh always over here i have to ask you because there's this whenever anyone says anything about tata and you know buying jlr from ford everyone talks about how they were treated badly and things that like that that is total rubbish But that story is gone all over yeah, the yeah i'm sure it's just been it is total, open legend right total nonsense is just made up for clickbaits okay. he never had a bad experience with ford i think he said when he met them all they talked about was his uh, football or baseball team or something like that so that's all it was there was no right. in fact if at all and not many people knew this he was worried because indica sales had really come down that he might need a global partner he actually met gm in hong kong prit henderson at that time uh, nothing came of it and again i think i want to take this to talk about how fiercely independent tata motors has been you know they've really not wanted joint ventures uh, they've talked to a lot of people they talked to volkswagen they've talked to peugeot everyone's talked to them but they've really valued their independence uh, a lot like suzuki has in a lot a lot and that all comes from a very strong leader a very patriotic leader who wants you know to continue to being indian uh, you know a homegrown company punching above its weight taking on global multinationals you know it's a real david and goliath story in a way and that's really what Tata Motors has done with the uh, starting with the Indica and then and moving forward. But was but there is one JV which they did enter and actually survives till today, right? The Tata Fiat uh, joint venture, and that, I, I that, think it's it's you know that's true. And okay. and again, you know, I think uh, 
uh, it started out because uh, I think uh, Ratan Tata had a great uh, relationship with Luca de Montezemolo, Sergio, Sergio Marchione, Marchione. Yeah. and they actually came to him and saying, "Look, can you help us out <laughs> in a way?" And he we actually tried to do that, you know, with a joint venture on the retail side and on the engine side. I think that is a brilliant joint venture, uh, which has really lasted. Uh, I think, to be honest, there are some tight legal clauses which makes it very difficult for e any partner to exist, but it's still existing. Possibly the the, the, one of the, few, the yeah the manufacturing one of the few joint ventures that's still going on now. It's Telantis and uh, Tata Motors. At that time, it was with Fiat. But again, you know, a vision to kind of uh, get into this kind of manufacturing where. That time, the Fiat 1.3 multi-jet was the diesel to have. And he got into a joint venture with that. In fact, they benefited a lot because when Maruti was running out of their own capacity, you know, they set up their own engine plant for that. They had to buy from this joint venture. And what I hear is that, you know, they, didn't, they sold it at a good price to them. So, you know, again, a lot of uh, benefit out of this joint venture too. Passenger division has been challenged, you know, profitability, all that. It's not easy making money with the passenger cars. Uh, in fact, recently, you know, uh, 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 it's, uh, I think, Mr. Chandra Shekharan, uh, the head of uh, Tata Sons, uh, chairman of Tata Sons, told us in an interview that, you know, people, in fact, told him to shut down the division. But, you know, they've, they persevered uh, through these ups and downs. And today, you know, he has transformed it and really taken Mr. Tata's legacy that step forward. So really, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a phenomenal story. Here. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we've spoken a lot about the Indy car, but I want to also go back a bit to another car, which for me is like a, almost like a personal favorite. And I think, uh, again, Radhan Tata had a lot to do with it. And that was the Sierra. I think the first, and literally, the, it was the, the mark, you know, the transition from truck maker to car maker, signal the end. And this might have sort of, you know, set the wind in the sails. But I think that sort of got them in the direction, right? And and it was him who was involved did, in the He did. So all these cars, he also refers to as bridge products. You know, they were built on a chassis of the Tata 207. Right. Uh, they had that uh, two-liter engine, engine yeah. 1948cc. I remember that, right. you know. A uh, lot of mechanical issues. But, you know, fantastic ride. Right. I think that's the other thing. Ride comfort, another Tata all, all, through, Tata. all through, you know, which uh, I think has been a lot driven by him and his engineers. Uh, uh, again, but you know, it, it it looked fantastic. Again, showing the design. Then you know, you had the Safari, which came, which really I think was the first influence of his. A very clean-looking car, very straightforward, uh, not too flash. You know, unlike the Scorpio, which was uh, really in your face. This again was understated elegance, simple lines, less is more. Just like the man himself. Right. You know, but honestly, I think uh, another influence he had. I don't know if we talked about that enough. Was on the in on the interior. Tata cars actually always had the best-in-class cabin space. So, it started with the Safari, Indica as well. Right. And even, even the, the Nano, Nano. Yeah. Even the Nano. The Nano had to have you be able to four six-footers to be able to sit inside comfortably. Because Mr. Tata is a six-footer himself. Exactly. He had to fit inside. Yeah, he had to fit inside. So, that was a radical design going to rear engine. But I think, you know, the Nano again was, I would say, one of his big disappointments. And that's really sad because... If you look at it, again, it kind of exemplifies what the man is and what he wanted. You know, seeing people on a motorbike, he felt they deserved better personal. Uh, yeah, personal mobility and safer mobility. And that's how the idea of the Nano was born, you know, to really be uh, 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 a bike on four wheels. Uh, and it was designed that way to take large families and amazing price again of one lakh, uh, amazing bookings. But I think what perhaps he didn't quite gauge or didn't have the pulse on and neither the whole company is how aspirational car buyers were already becoming, you know, and they didn't want a car that was seen to be cheap or, you know, it's uh, you're not successful. That's why you can't afford anything better. It wasn't positioned initially as a smart, cool city car. Uh, you had the whole, you know, let's say single dislocation in West Bengal, maybe another, you know, let's say, error of judgment going to that state just given the issues but again you know wanted to go in good faith he did a lot of things in good faith and for the greater good you know to kind of make sure that others also benefited so uh, uh, and uh, you know so but then of course moving into Sanand and, and then all the fires that there were so I think Nano had a uh, really very troubled start. start and you know never quite recovered from it and as I said you know I think uh, uh, let's say the market also moved on <coughs> also honestly 
uh, as a product, it was too basic. And, you know, you had, but I think what the Nano did and what a lot of, uh, you know, I think, again, the legacy of that is it inspired global automakers to do low-cost cars. And here, you know, I want to replay, which we have done, you know, Carlos Ghosn actually saying that the quid was inspired by uh, Ratan Tata's Nano. When uh, Ratan came with the Nano, I told him, brilliant, I congratulate him. And he said I was the only one who congratulated him because a lot of people said, bad idea. No, good idea. And I'm glad at the end of the day, we came with the quid and the quid was inspired by the Nano. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's sad when you think about that, from us, right? that it's so ironic that a thought like that was actually proved to be the nail in its coffin. I mean, I, I remember, they, you know, they sent us a briefing document uh, at my previous company and there was a quote of Ratan's in that briefing document for the first time. He said that, I never intended for it to be a one lakh car. I just said that and it got picked up and unfortunately became the marketing image. We want you all to change this image. Yeah. And, and yeah. then for him, a promise is a promise. Yes. Famous life. So, yeah, to stick to that one. So, yeah. it, it, it was dubbed the one like car. The one like car. It's really, yeah. I think that kind of went against it all totally. to, to, to an extent. Totally. And Oros, besides this car, you also took and gifted him another one of your prized possessions, right? The, the Nano. I think the Nano, you know, I think uh, we were enjoying it. Honestly, we bought it as a long termer. We did what he had to do. The car was discontinued and. Uh, uh, frankly, you know, I, maybe I should have kept the car, but I just felt, you know, uh, I wanted to give him this car, uh, which I did. And uh, I was happy I did because uh, clearly, you know, this again was another baby of his. I think two real babies of his were the Indy car and the Nano. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it was uh, just, uh, I'm so happy he, he, you know, he's got the car and, uh, you know, was, I think he was driving it occasionally. Uh, yeah, I think he much. even registered it in, in his name. Yeah, obviously. He really I mean, was happy he with it. Do everything to the book. So, I mean, finally, that was his car. So, uh, very happy that he's got that. Or was you also bonded with him uh, a lot over, you know, of, of course, anniversaries and meeting him for certain occasions, but over cars specifically. Uh, his love for cars, your love uh, for cars. But I have to ask you one question because it's a very peculiar thing that, that I'm sure a lot of people might have noticed as well. A lot of his cars that he bought, you know, the foreign imported cars, the Ferrari or whatever, left-hand drive. I mean, why was that? Well, well, they had right-hand drive versions. Well, you know, honestly, that was a quirk and there's no real answer. I mean, okay. maybe, you know, there's got to be a Parsi to know that these things do happen. <laughs> okay. But uh, I think I asked him once, you know, why have you got left-hand drive cars? He just chuckled and he said, no, I'm, I've been used to driving left-hand drive cars from the US. I like to exit on the pavement side. <laughs> and, you know, later on it became a you had to get special, you know, exemption and dispensation from DGFT to get the left-hand drive cars. But he went through all that effort. But, you know, his cars were absolutely in mint condition. I remember we were doing a photo shoot uh, for an anniversary issue. We always had, uh, you know, the kind of um, a pleasure of uh, or a tradition of doing an interview with him for every anniversary issue of ours when he was, uh, you know, let's say, uh, chairman until he retired. And I'm very pleased that, you know, I hope we've started this uh, tradition now with uh, the current chairman, Mr. Chandra Sekharan, who was there with our, for our 25th issue. But anyway, coming back to that, um, you know, uh, so we had the Nano and, and the Ferrari and it started raining a bit. I was going for a drive with him in his Ferrari and he had all mats over there, but even that wasn't enough. He made me get another mat from the Indica, put it there so my wet feet wouldn't wet. The Ferrari mat. <laughs> the Ferrari mat. So, uh, absolutely, you know, like most Parsis, just loves his cars, you know, and they were in what you call absolute mint, chaka chuck condition. I remember that Chrysler Sebring of his, it might have been about 15 years old, but, uh, you know, it, it still almost smelt new. And uh, so, really looked after his cars. I remember also, you know, uh, at, at his place, uh, he has a, a basement where there's a lift that takes the cars down there. And he was telling me that uh, I think he drove the architect mad because when the lift came up, it wasn't leveling exact with the floor. So when he drive the car, there'd be a little bit of a bump and he couldn't handle that. So he wanted it absolutely, absolutely. flush so it would be smooth. So these are just some small details of, of his. And, you know, even just, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, the, when going for him for a drive, he was so comfortable with cars, you know, just the way his hands moved on the Manatino, you know, using the paddle shift. He'd rev it up just to hear the sound. And, you know, you realize, look, this guy's flown, flown helicopters and, and planes. So, you know, just being utterly comfortable in a car was uh, just came almost like second nature to him. 
And Hormuz, from what I understand, India's first Formula One driver, Narain Karthikeyan, also owes a lot to Ratan Tata personally, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, let's be very clear. It wasn't just the Tata group, or let's say it wasn't the Tata group, but specifically Ratan Tata, which got Narain into Formula One. I mean, it was very simple. You know, he got the Jordan drive. It was hugely expensive, you know, to you had to pay for the seat at that time. Uh, I think the whole season at that time was 2 million uh, euros, which at that point, 2005 from one I stand, was about 14, 15 crores. Now, how do you get ROI on 14, 15 crores? So, if you go to a typical company, they'd want to know what is the ROI, what are the deliverables, this, that. Just not possible because, you know, the races are televised beyond a point. I mean, how much can you kind of deliver? You, They'd probably say, I'll get more out of cricket spending 14, 15 crores than doing anything with you. But for Ratan Tata, that just wasn't the issue. I mean, for him, India had a chance to get its first Formula One driver, which we did in 2005, even before China. You know, I mean, our great rival, so to speak. Okay. We had an Indian driver before China had a driver in Formula One. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, that's just what it was. For him, it wasn't about, uh, you know, and I think Narayan had to deal with the marketing guys that time to kind of, in a way, justify that investment. Really, you know, wasn't a big deal. I mean, did as much as he could. But for Ratan Tata is that, you know, it, it was, again, something to be done for the country. I mean, a great thing to have an Indian in Formula One at the pinnacle of the sport. And clearly, Narain had the talent, you know, I mean, uh, at, at that yes. point to be able to compete in Formula One. So, it it was as simple as that. And uh, I think I remember in at, at the uh, Bahrain Grand Prix, I think Jackie Stewart came up to Ratan Tata and said, you don't know what you've done. You know, you've done a great service to the sport of getting another country, a populous country like India and getting an Indian in there and kind of, you know, promoting the sport in that sense. And that's what it was. Because I think uh, Formula One was really at its peak at that time, being televised everywhere. There were these sports bars having, you know, Formula One viewings. Narain obviously uh, was, uh, you know, really... Uh, uh, generated a lot of interest and I think from uh, Narain's point of view again you know he's been absolutely loyal to the Tata group ever since yes. because you know after he got that break thanks to him uh, you know I think he, he he realized that but again you know just coming back to uh, it was you know just one man's vision that you know this needs to be done and just shows that he just keeps thinking of the greater good. So, Urvas, clearly, you know, there's a lot to remember Ratan Tata fondly by. Is there one story, though, from all of your interactions with him that really, I, I would say, is the, the most dearest to you? Well, I think, you know, there's one thing which kind of struck out, struck me as the kind of man he is and why we will miss him. Because, really, they don't make leaders or powerful people like this anymore. You know, Typically, uh, when you're as big as he is, as powerful he is, you know, you would imagine him hobnobbing with powerful people and not looking at anyone, you know, lesser than him. With him, it was just the opposite. Totally the opposite. I mean, I would say that the person who probably went maximum in his Ferrari was one of his staff's daughters. Uh, I remember at the Geneva Motor Show, this is the story I remember, it was probably the last motor show he had done. And, uh, you know, he, everyone wanted a picture with him because they thought he wasn't going to come back as chairman. Anyway, don't forget, Geneva Motor Show was a thing for Tata Motors. You know, uh, every year it was there for always a long, there. always yeah. there. And, you know, he would have that dinner, which later on I was invited to, I was happy to be there with the team. But at the last thing, everyone wanted a picture with him. And, you know, he doesn't like too much fuss and it kind of puts him off. The only person he really posed properly for a picture was one of the staff who had been there for around the, the cleaning lady who would clean the stall. He took a picture with her. Now that tells you what the man is about. I mean, I've heard stories that, you know, he's been invited for maybe a dinner with Prince Charles at that time or whatever. He's not gone because the dog is not well. You know, he, he's not interested in this if he doesn't have to go. It's like, you know, it doesn't, he doesn't kind of look forward to it or, 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 or need it. He doesn't need to. A man as big as him really doesn't need to. But it's really the lesser people who he looks after, the way he lives at home. Simple, absolutely simple. 
For, and another story which I think uh, Rehruka was there and we all laughed about it, which I will never forget is the last interview we did uh, with him. And uh, we just play a small clip of that, then I'll come back to you on the behind the scenes uh, incident. Mr. Tata, uh, over your career at the head of this company, what are the highs and, and what are the lows, just very briefly? Well, I think in developing an indigenous car that was the Indica, it was a, a high to me because uh, it was the fulfillment of something that I thought could be done and everyone said couldn't be. And any other high points, Jaguar Land Rover, I think that yeah, must Jaguar be. Jaguar Land Rover, I think again was an achievement. I'm very proud of what JLR has been able to do in the marketplace and uh, that we have succeeded in dispelling the apprehensions people had of are Indianizing the company. We, we, the goal that I set, which I hope we can achieve, would be to restore these two brands to their original glory as English companies. Right. And the low points, Mr. Tata, I mean, sure, there must be a lot of disappointments along the way. Yeah, I think maybe Singur and its problems, having to move a plant and, and uh, lose that time, very importantly, and then issues on nano also relate to the fact that it was delayed by a year as a result of the Singur issue. And uh, that, that would constitute a low point. Cars have been a strong, strong passion with you. Uh, I, I'm sure if there is a, a need to be involved in the areas you are quite keen on and you've not been able to devote too much time to, let's say like product design and strategy. I think if, if that's what the company wanted, uh, I would be very happy to do whatever I could to add value. But it would have to be something that the company desired rather than my seeking it. So that was the last interview we had with him uh, and you can see in the interview that you know he loves uh, for cars to be involved is still very much there uh, and you know I think from a design point he would have loved to have con continued to be involved and actually he was in some way right till the end because you know they were running a lot of designs past him. Uh, yeah, but always you were saying there's a backstory to this clip. Also. Yeah, sorry I, I, I got sidetracked over there. There's a great backstory to that. So, uh, when we were setting up for the interview, it was outside his house and, you know, his house in Kolaba, uh, you enter and uh, at the end of the lane, it's just his place and there's maybe just one other house over there. So, really, it's a pretty good result. Yeah, it's a, it's a dead end. There's no one over there. So, we set up the camera, put it on the road. He comes away, obviously, everything set up. We called him out. He comes out and he just stops over there. I said, oh, oh like, you know, what's the issue? First thing he said is, that camera is blocking the road. What if my neighbor wants to come, he won't be able to pass. And you know, I mean, that said a lot. You know, we had to move the camera just for this off chance. We would inconvenience someone. And I think that really sums up what Ratan Tata is. You know, always thinking of other people. Uh, you know, I, you can imagine other big industries might just shut down the, shut down the whole city. Yeah, And I think that's why we will miss him deeply because there's really no other industrialist like this that we have seen, you know, who's there for the greater good, who cares about society, people around him. He's one of the good guys, you know, all powerful industrialists, let's be honest, not very nice. And that's why I think his loss will be, you know, we'll just miss him terribly. He's probably the most loved industrialist and it's just the way he is as a person. Ratan Tata, Godspeed my friend, we will really miss you deeply.